just read uh, two verses from uh, Galatians chapter 4. Uh, Galatians, um, we'll look at a little bit more this evening, uh, is actually a letter written to a, ser a group of churches in Galatia to try to correct the bad teaching they were being given by a group uh, of Jews who perhaps were well-meaning, but were trying to add things to the gospel. They were trying to add circumcision in particular, saying that it's not enough to believe in the Lord Jesus. You must also be circumcised and observe the law of Moses in order to be saved. Well, Paul is writing to them to tell them that Jesus is all you need. You need to just trust in him alone, in his obedience, in his death on the cross, and receive him as your Lord and Savior. That is all you need. Now, what we're going to focus on in, in this passage this morning is what it is that uh, God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ that makes him a complete Savior for us, that makes him all that we need. And we're going to see it really in just two verses, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. So let me just read those for you as we begin. Paul writes, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the churches in Galatia, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. What we have here is a summary of the good news, a summary of the gospel. So what we want to do this morning is take a look at what is in these two verses. Um, may the Lord bless our understanding and may he show us again the things he wants us to see this morning. Now, as I was thinking about this, I'm reminded that, that every week when we get together on this day, which we, we, we understand is called in Scripture the Lord's Day, the day that belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the day that he rose again from the dead we have the opportunity to remember what it is that Jesus has done for us. Now, every Lord's Day, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the reason we do that is because it reminds us of how much God loved us so much that he was willing to give us his son to die for us and that Jesus was willing to come into the world and lay down his life for us. That's what the Lord's Table reminds us of. But this day, as I've already mentioned, also reminds us of what happened to Jesus after he died and was in the tomb for three days. He rose again from the dead. And the Bible says because he rose from the dead, everyone who trusts in him will also be raised on that last day when Jesus comes again. And so that there isn't any mistake, Jesus did say to Martha at the resurrection of Lazarus, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And what he means by that is even though our bodies may die, our souls will live and go to be with the Lord until the time our bodies are raised from the dead. Now, every Lord's Day, we have the opportunity to remember those things, his death and his resurrection, the things through which we have life if we're trusting in him. The Lord made it this way because he doesn't want us to forget who our hope is the Lord Jesus Christ, who it is that's going to bring us into heaven. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, what we don't think about as often is that in order to do these things for us, Jesus first had to come into the world. He had to become one of us. Now, it's not that we don't think about his birth. I think we, we do this at least every Christmas as we see the nativity scenes all around, as we sing the Christmas carols, perhaps hear the Christmas carols, as we go to Christmas services, we're reminded. But I think we often forget just how great this gift is, which the Father has given to us in His Son. We forget how blessed we are that we're actually on this side of the cross rather than on the other side, as we sang in our opening hymn. Uh, where the people of God had to look for the Messiah through the promises, through the prophecies, and through the shadows. How blessed we are that God was actually willing to give us His Son, the one whom He loves so much. And how blessed we are that Jesus was willing to do what was necessary in order to save us from our sins. So that's what I would like us to think about for a few minutes this morning. Now, first of all, I want us to think about the fact that we're blessed because Jesus has already come. 
that we're on this side of the cross and we're not on the other side of the cross. That God's promise, all of his promises, have been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has revealed to us his salvation. And that's what we see in verse 4 of, of our passage this morning. Paul writes, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son. Now, I think we understand by reading the Bible that God did not send his son right away. He didn't send him immediately after the fall, at the moment when Adam and Eve made what we would consider today, looking back, and certainly what they considered to be the worst decision that has ever been made in history, perhaps next to Judas' decision to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam and Eve decided that they would disobey God and that they would rebel against him and that they would side with God's enemy, the devil. The Bible tells us that that choice that they made brought this world into all the difficulties that we have to face today. All the hatred that we see, all the killing that we see, the poverty, the sickness, the death, it all comes from the fall, from the curse that came upon this world, the curse that came upon us, as well as the things we've seen in the newspapers at least a few weeks ago. We were looking at earthquakes, many hurricanes, fires that I think are still ongoing uh, in California. All of these, what we call natural catastrophes, are all a part of the fall, which brought the curse upon us and upon this world. Now, as I've said, God did not send him right away because it wasn't yet the right time. But God did let us know at that time. He let Adam and Eve know right after the fall that that was what he was intending to do when he pronounced his curse on the devil for his part in our rebellion. He basically said he was going to send his son into the world to turn all these things back around. Genesis 3.15, the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity, that is, I will put hatred between you and the woman and between your seed, those who follow you, and her seed, those who are going to be in the camp of those who follow the Lord. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Basically, through this promise, God was, was saying that he was going to send Jesus the child of the woman, the seed of the woman, to give his life that he might destroy or crush the devil's power over us. This is the first promise he gave, and he gave it right after the fall, which brought us into the situation that we were in. God made this promise. Now, he also promised Abraham that through one of his offspring, one of his children, that he would bring blessing to the entire world. In Genesis 22:18. God says to Abraham, in, in your seed, that is, in your offspring, and one seed in particular, the Lord Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Well, how will they be blessed? Well, they'll be blessed because he will turn them from their sins and give them life as they trust in him. And it will be not just for the Jews, but for the entire world. He promised King David, when David wanted to build him this, this great house for worship, that he would build David a house instead. He would raise up one of David's sons, one of his children, and establish his throne forever, and that son would build him a house, a house made out of living stones, those who would trust him and follow him and would worship him forever. So here's another promise that God gave that he was going to send his son into the world. He said to David through Nathan the prophet in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 13, David, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And he wasn't referring just to Solomon who actually built the temple of God at that time, but he was referring to the Lord Jesus Christ who was going to build a temple that would last forever again made of living stones, everyone who would trust in his son and would worship him. Now he told us how he was going to do this as well through Jeremiah the prophet. Through his son, he would make a new covenant, not like the Mosaic covenant, the one he made with Israel when he brought them out of Egypt 
and gave them his law, which basically could not save them. But he was going to make a new covenant, a new agreement between God and man in which he would take away our sins and give us the power to obey him by taking his law and writing it on our hearts. He says in Jeremiah 31, verses 33 through 34, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, and I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Now, as I've said, God did not send his son into the world right away. There were many years between the time he made the promises and Jesus actually came. But those who believed what God said waited and watched their entire lifetimes because they were expecting this to take place for God to send his Savior because they knew how important his coming was. They knew their forgiveness. God's mercy depended on this one. And even though many of them lived and died without actually ever seeing him with their eyes, they did see him through faith. They believed God's promise. And those who saw him and believed were saved. You know, Jesus said that Abraham, who lived hundreds of years before Jesus came into the world, saw him. He saw him through that promise that was given to him. Jesus said to the Jews in John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. And they said, you're not, you're 50 years old and you've seen Abraham who lived hundreds of years ago and, and he said, well, before Abraham was born, I am. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But Abraham saw Jesus through the promises. And when Abraham saw him, and when he believed in him, Abraham was forgiven. Abraham was clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Abraham was saved. Paul writes in Romans 4, verses 1 through 3. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified, that is, if he was declared righteous or saved by his works, he has something to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He believed the promise of God. He believed in the coming of the Messiah. He looked to the Messiah and the Messiah's righteousness, which was yet to be done in the future, was actually credited to him in the past. His heart was changed. He was saved. Now, the point I want to make is this, that we're blessed because we don't have to look for him to come through the shadows of the Old Testament, through the promises, through the prophecies, through these many pictures that God gave of the Messiah. The fullness of the time has already come. Jesus has already been sent. And he has already done what God said he would do, that he might become the savior of the world. All you need to do is look to him. Even as Abraham looked to him, even as these in the past looked to him, and everyone who has ever trusted in Jesus has looked to him. All you need to do is look to him, like the serpent that was lifted up on the staff when God sent the serpents among the people because of their disobedience. He put this bronze serpent on a staff, and everyone who looked to it was instantly healed from what the serpents were actually doing. Jesus said, so the Son of Man would be lifted up so that all who looked to him in faith would be saved. All you have to do is be willing to turn from your sins, look to Jesus and receive him, and he will save you. Save you from what our sins actually deserve, which is everlasting destruction. So we're blessed because we're on this side of the cross. We can look back. We can see fulfillment. Now, secondly, we're blessed because of who it is that God has actually given to us. Again, we read in verse 4. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son. Now, I hope you understand this, but there's really two senses in which Jesus is God's Son. He was conceived and born his Son in time, in this world. 
but he is also eternally the Son of God. Now, first of all, he was conceived and born his son in time. That's what we're thinking about this morning at, at Christmas time. Paul tells us in verse 4 that also that Jesus was born of a woman. He came into this world in order to save us. But to do this, he had to become one of us. He had to be connected to our race. He had to be connected to the human race. We are the ones who rebelled against God. We rebelled against him in Adam as he represented us in the garden, but all of us have rebelled against him since that time, numerous times, from the time we came into the earth to the time he saved us, and even times after that we have sinned against the Lord. We have all rebelled, and because we have, we owe the debt to God's justice. We are the ones under the curse. Now, if Jesus was to pay the debt that we owe, he had to do it from our side. He had to be one with us. And that's exactly what he did. He became one with us through a supernatural conception brought about in, uh, by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin whose name was Mary. Now, Mary didn't understand all of this either. When the angel uh, came to Mary and she saw the angel who was sent to tell her about this great miracle, she was afraid. But we read in Luke 1, verses 30 to 35, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. He's going to be called the Son of God because literally he is God's Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So essentially what we see here is the Holy Spirit doing a work very similar to what he did at the beginning of the creation. He was hovering over the earth when the earth was described as empty and void. And he was bringing order and fullness to the creation. As God would speak, the Holy Spirit would act and would work to fashion the earth. Well, in the same way, the Holy Spirit here is hovering over Mary's empty womb to bring about the fullness of God's promise by taking from her substance and creating the human nature of Jesus, uniting him with our race so that he could do what he needed to do in order to save us. But Jesus is the Son of God also in another sense. Remember, there's two senses. He is also the eternal Son of God. Again, we read in verse 4, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son. Now, notice here that the one he sends into the world is already called the Son of God, and the reason is because he is the eternal Son of God. Jesus is not just an ordinary person like you or like me. He is a divine person. He is God the Son. Now, God tells us in his word that he is and has always been three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When the Spirit conceived that child in Mary's womb, what he did was he joined that human nature with the person of the eternal Son of God so that Jesus might be both God and man. And you know what? That is the only way that God could have actually saved us is if he gave us one who is both God and man. He had to be man to take our place. But he had to be God in order to make a payment that might be valuable enough fully to satisfy God's justice. Remember, we, when we sin, we sin against an infinitely holy and worthy God. And the only just penalty for that is everlasting suffering in hell because we can never fully satisfy the, the, just the, the depth of that crime we've committed. But one who is infinitely worthy can do it easily by laying his life down on the cross. 
So we are also blessed because the Father was willing to give one who is able to pay our debt. But beyond that, let's not forget who this one is. The eternal Son of God, the one who is in the bosom of the Father, the one whom the Father loves more than anyone else. He was willing to give him in order that he might have us. Now, Jesus is the only one who can re reconcile us to God. He's the only one who can pay this debt, why, which is why Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you want someone to pay your debt, Jesus is the only one who can do it. And if that's what you want, all you need to do is be willing to turn from your sins and look to him in faith and receive the Lord Jesus. And he will make a full payment for your sins. He will cancel out your debt, give you his righteousness, and justify you. You will be saved. Now, finally, we're blessed because Jesus was willing to do this for us. He was willing to come into the world and do what was necessary in order to save us. Paul writes in verses 4 and 5, really our text, When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, that we might become the sons and daughters of God. We're actually going to look at that more fully tonight. Now, Jesus, or excuse me, Paul tells us, first of all, that Jesus was born under the law. And what he means by that, he was born into a Jewish family. So he was under the obligation to keep the law that God had given to Israel. And again, that law is very extensive. But there's another sense in which he was born under the law. And that is, he voluntarily submitted to the law, placed himself under that righteous standard so that he might fulfill it for us and free us from the curse of the broken law of God. The Bible says, as I've been reminding us over and over again, that we have all sinned, which means we have all broken God's law. If, if you want to know whether or not that's true, read the Ten Commandments and ask yourself, have you done these things from the time you were born to the present? Have you done them in your mind, in your words, in your heart, as well as in your actions? And have you done them because you love the Lord and you want to give him glory? If you haven't done those things, you haven't obeyed him, you've sinned. The Bible says we have all sinned. Paul writes in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because we've done that, because we've broken the law of God, we are under the curse of the law. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. The curse of the law is death. And Paul here is not talking about just the death that we're all going to have to face when our days on earth come to an end. Everyone must die. But he's talking here about eternal death. He's talking about eternal punishment in hell. Now, Jesus voluntarily placed himself under the law that he might obey the law so that he could do what we fail to do. He could do it right. He could do it perfectly. And he also, in doing this, agreed to take the curse on himself, the curse of death, actually hell. On the cross, he went to the cross the sins of everyone who would ever trust in him were imputed to him, credited to him, and he died to pay for them. But before he died, he suffered on the cross, suffered tremendous torment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He suffered hell on the cross for everyone who would trust in him. In other words, he took the curse, curse both of the suffering and curse of death so that he might free us from that curse, that we might be free from death and that we might be free from hell and that we might receive the blessing of salvation. If we're only willing to turn from our sins and to receive him by faith. Paul writes this in Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Christ, notice, became a curse for us 
so that we might be freed from the curse that we were under. He took it on himself, paid the price so that all who trust him might live. Now again, we've seen that those who lived before Jesus, who were looking forward to his coming, were saved by trusting him. It's also true that all who live after him, who look back on what he has done to his life and to his death, to his resurrection and ascension, and who look to the risen Christ in heaven by faith, who are willing to turn from their sins and trust him, they too are saved. Now let me just close by, by saying this one thing. It's not enough to know these things. It's not enough to know that all these things are true. It's not even enough to believe that these things actually happen, that Jesus really is who he said he, he is and that he has done what he said he has done. The Lord says you must be willing to turn from all of your sins, everything that you know that you're doing that breaks the law of God, and you must receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to trust him and what he's done alone to get you into heaven. Not what you've done, not what you're doing, not what you're going to do. Don't look to your works at all. The reason why Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians was to tell them, don't add circumcision to what Jesus has done. Jesus did it all. Look to Jesus only. You have to trust him alone to get you into heaven if you are to be saved. Now, if that's what you've done, then you will see heaven. Salvation, eternal life is a gift of God. God gives it. He never takes it back. If you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and you basically your life evidences that you have, it shows that you have because you're being transformed into the image of God. You're practicing righteousness, as, as John says that we will do in Scripture. Then you have been saved and you will see heaven. But if this isn't true of you, I just want to encourage you this morning as we think again about this great gift that God is offering to you. Receive it. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be willing to turn from your sins and to trust in Him. And you will be saved. May the Lord give you the grace to do that if you haven't trusted in Him. Well, let's bow just for a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to uh, take His Word and, and apply it to each one of us as we need to hear it this morning.